welcome to the Beckler for tonight's forum featuring Dr. Jonathan Fisher. That's right, thank you, thank you. My name is Lillian Parker. I support marketing and communications and programming with the Charlotte Center. Um, as many of you may know, our focus here is on the humanities and civic imagination. So we're gonna talk just a little bit about what that means to us and the intersection of those two things. The humanities help us make sense of the world. They ask questions about what is good, how should we live, and what's the right thing to do. Through poetry, literature, philosophy, music, the humanities offer a different kind of conversation that seeks to understand who we are and who we can be. To admit I don't think I've ever watched someone play cello I didn't know you could do it without the boat that was incredible <laughs> you learn something new every day um, my name is Ashley Rivenbark I am a lead facilitator for an organization called mind gym uh, and I have been collaborating with the, the Charlotte Center in, in a facilitative capacity so I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to generating conversation before we, we dive into the main event so I'll go ahead and pop up the question we are going to be discussing. Um, so as you saw before, if you thought you were just gonna show up and listen to a lecture, this is not that. Um, we are going to be engaging with one another prior to, to hopping in. And so what I ask of you is for the next, we'll take about eight minutes, turn to someone that you did not come with, right? Somebody new, introduce yourself, and then answer this question, right? When you hear the word heart, what comes to mind? for you, there are no right or wrong answers. All right, go ahead, have at it, we'll do eight minutes. So I'm tasked with introducing the speaker, Dr. Fisher. Now about eight years ago, when I first moved to Charlotte, I was asked to share a very small office, almost a matchbox, with one other guy, and it turned out it was Dr. Fisher. Now it quickly became obvious, in some ways he was pretty typical, compared to other cardiologists I'd met. He was obviously very well trained, he was bright, he worked hard, but it also quickly became obvious that he was different. He was about some other things. He had some different ideas. He had different ideas about what were making patients sick. He had different ideas about how we should spend that precious 15 to 30 minutes we had in the room. He was actually doing stuff like meditating with them. He was talking about healthcare, worker, well-being, and physician burnout. So if only out of respect for my old school cardiology mentors, I took it upon myself to cure Dr. Fisher of some of his <laughs> more tangential ideas and better align him with being a traditional cardiologist. Well, through eight years of daily conversations about medicine, life, philosophy, it turns out he cured me of some of my more outdated ideas. I'm presenting him today because I'm a believer and a supporter of many of his ideas. Now, to those of you who don't know Dr. Fisher well, he's a Mount Sinai and Harvard trained cardiologist, mindfulness meditation teacher, and an organizational well-being and resiliency leader at Novant. I think he leads a team of about 38,000. He's delivered keynotes and workshops on the mind-heart connection, heartful leadership, 
stress mastery and total well-being and he's delivered such to teams like IBM, Bank of America, IE Business School, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine among others. Now in 2020 he co-founded the Ending Clinician Burnout Global Community and that year hosted the first global summit for ending clinician burnout. I was one of over a thousand participants from 43 countries. Now Dr. Fisher's much anticipated book, Just One Heart, A Cardiologist's Guide to Healing, Health and Happiness would be released in March. Now a wise man once said to me, when you're in season, you should have your biggest impact. Jonathan, you my friend are in season and I salute that you are trying to have the biggest import, impact with this message about the mind-heart connection. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you Jonathan Fisher. There's some research that says if you wanna know how happy someone is at work, Ask them if they have one good friend. That's all it takes. I'm happy at work. <laughs> Denzel, I'm not supposed to be crying <laughs> as I'm getting pissed <laughs> off. That was a dirty trick. I'm going to get you back. <laughs> I want to acknowledge uh, Mark Perez, who is the reason that we're all here, the founder of the Charlotte Center, who had this glimmer of a thought years ago and invited me to be a part of it and get to relive some of my college days and discussing humanities and the deeper questions of our time. I want to thank Mark, and I want to thank each and every one of you, friends old and new, from the bottom of my lungs. <laughs> it doesn't have quite the same ring to it, does it? And why is that? Why do we have such a strong association with so many emotions that we heard here. I heard from Whitney about passion in the heart. And we heard from Tony and Ethan, brilliant answers as well, about the physical beating of the heart. And we heard from my, I think it was my son Noah in the back, that the heart is associated with love. We've heard that the heart is associated with authenticity. I struggle to associate the heart with any one thing because it has connotations that go back to the beginning of human history. We're going to explore some of those tonight. Before we do, I would like you each, I'll invite you, to take your right hand and place it over the heart space right now. And if your left hand is free, feel free to place your left hand like a support, just a buttress on top of the right. Allow yourself to take a nice deep breath in through your nostrils and fill up your belly with a nice refreshing breath. And exhale slowly and completely all the way through your mouth, letting it all go slowly and completely. One more time, deep breath in through the nostrils, filling up the belly with fresh oxygen. Blowing out slowly and completely and letting go of something. Letting go of memories and worries from today and thoughts of tomorrow. Letting go of preconceived notions about what we're going to be discussing, what you think you know, who you think you are. Let it all go for this talk. One more deep breath in. Breathe into the space in and around your heart now. And as you let it go, just check in with your heart, asking it a question. How is my physical heart feeling? And maybe you can feel it beating in your chest. Maybe you can't feel it. Notice if it's quick or slow or steady or unsteady. And checking in a level deeper now into the social dimension of your heart. Are you nurtured by relationships, the people around you? Do you have a friend, many friends? Do you love them? Do they love you? Checking in with your emotional heart. What have been the predominant emotions you've felt in the last day or week? Has there been joy and laughter, sadness and grief? 
some combination. Checking in now, asking your heart how it's doing spiritually, whatever that means for you, not in a religious sense, but in a sense of feeling connected with all things, with something bigger, a sense of purpose in your life and meaning. And without judgment, just noticing any shifts in the body and the space around your heart as you're just breathing and feeling into your own heart, checking in. And letting go of that, letting your eyes open and your hands relax when it feels right. When I felt my heart, I still had some of the resonance of Peter's bowstrings. Did anyone feel any shifts in their body when he was playing so beautifully? So there's scientific studies, many of them now, showing that when we listen to the same piece of music, our hearts can enter into a state of synchrony. We're not sure if that's because our breathing slows and we're relaxed, or if it quickens, or if we feel a sense of community, but this is now well documented, that our hearts, as Peter was playing, we're coming into some kind of unity, which is part of the message of tonight's talk, Just One Heart. So why am I here? I'm here because for 25 years, I thought I was going to be one kind of a heart doctor. Come to see me, tell me about chest pain, tell me about palpitations, tell me about your blood pressure, tell me about your father who died of a heart attack at a young age and how afraid you are that something's gonna happen to you. And you don't want that to happen. And I found out that there were only so many tests and so many medicines I could prescribe and so many bypass surgeries I could prescribe for my patients before I found that those same patients who had had a mechanical bypass over a blockage were coming back to me with the same problems, literally bypassing the underlying cause of it all. And so I said, well, the heart can't just be a physical pump. And as I was exploring the different dimensions of the heart, it was a few years back, I got a call around midnight to the emergency room. I was on call for the weekend, and they said, Dr. Fisher, we need you. There's a 58-year-old woman who's healthy as heck. She's having a massive heart attack. We don't know why. So I, I woke my wife, Julie, who's in the back, and I said, honey, I've got to go into the hospital. And I got my scrubs on, drove down the highway. And as I was driving down the highway, I felt the discomfort in my chest, my own chest. I felt a tightness and a squeezing and a quickening in my heart. Now, have any of you, just by show of hands, when you felt stressed or nervous or worried about something important, have you ever felt something in the heart area? There's no right or wrong answer. This is a universal experience. Perhaps this is why humans associate the whole spectrum of emotions with the heart itself. Now, if I asked you, when you feel nervous or stressed, how often do you feel something in one spot in your brain, hands aren't going to go up. And there's a theory that that's why we associate these emotions with the heart itself rather than the brain, even though we're going to discuss many of us think that emotions live in the brain and some live in the heart. So I arrive in the emergency room. And this wonderful woman, uh, I'm going to call her Mrs. V, she was there with pain in her chest, and I could see she was anxious. And she was also having an irregular, dangerous heart rhythm on the monitor called ventricular tachycardia, which is potentially life-threatening. So we had some work to do. And very quickly, with the help of the whole emergency room staff, we did some tests. And sure enough, the blood showed that she was having a heart attack. But she wasn't a smoker. She didn't have diabetes. She wasn't obese. There was no family history. It didn't make any sense until we took a picture of her heart with an ultrasound, a sonogram. And we saw that what had been a healthy, normally shaped heart just a few days before had taken a new shape. The whole tip of her heart was now ballooning outward abnormally and wasn't squeezing at all. Her heart was literally broken and not functioning. And she was developing congestion in her lungs called congestive heart failure. And so once I saw this, 
I fortunately had learned about a condition called the broken heart syndrome, also called the Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, discovered in Japan in Hiroshima Hospital in the 1990s, when a researcher, Dr. Sato, found that people who lived near an earthquake were experiencing heart attacks, lived near an earthquake. And so my patient, Mrs. V, was there. I went back to the bedside, and I said, has anything particularly stressful happened in your life? And I saw her eyes tear up. She said, well, yesterday we had to admit my daughter to a drug rehabilitation program. And I'm grieving the loss of my child. So we shared a moment together. And I could see there was a little release as she shared that with me. And we knew that that was some of the work we would have to do, not only in the hospital, but in the weeks that we followed up afterwards. Now, the good news is, with a little bit of tender love and care for me and the rest of the staff in the hospital and appropriate medical treatments, she recovered fully. We took another picture of her heart two weeks later as an outpatient, back to normal. This is not magic. This is not mysticism, that grief, that profound emotions can affect our physical heart. It's something that I've experienced, we've all experienced, and it can be a matter of life and death. And we're not talking about it in medical school. And most doctors, in my experience, are not talking about it. And I'm hoping that we can make a shift in our healthcare system to acknowledge these things. As it stands now, if you have a physical heart problem, you go to a physical heart doctor. If you have an emotional problem, you go to a mental health expert. Rightly so. If you have a spiritual issue, maybe you'll see a rabbi or a priest or an imam. If you have a social issue, maybe you'll see a social worker or someone who helps you with that. I'm not asking that we all become experts in everything. I'm not asking that your doctor does therapy with you or meditates with you. This is strictly an invitation to branch beyond our own areas of expertise to break down some of the silos that currently exist in the way we understand the human heart. There's another reason that I'm here. I should just be talking about the physical heart because we have a crisis in heart disease. Anyone aware? We've got rising rates of heart disease. There's been a 60% increase in cardiovascular disease in the last 30 years. 18 million people will die this year of heart attack or stroke. Now that's bad enough as it is until you consider that 80 to 90% of those people could have had their heart attack prevented. And this is from the World Health Organization. So I'm interested in what we call primordial prevention. Not waiting until someone has a problem. What can we do now? As adults and also as teenagers and also as children, what can we teach our children so that they don't fall into the same trap? Now, some of the reason for this is we're sedentary. There's a 30% rate of people around the world not getting physical exercise and activity. Why is that? The rates of diabetes are up. 650 million people around the world have diabetes and obesity. And I think it's all tied together. This is just the physical heart crisis we're facing. We also have an emotional crisis. Are there any mental health experts here? Psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, just by show of hands, a little bit higher? Awesome. Great. So far, thank you for not throwing tomatoes at me. <laughs> Appreciate that. Is it fair to say that we have a crisis of mental health in this country? Yeah, it is. You don't have to go far. You can look at our school systems. You can look at what's happening on social media with our teenagers and with us. 40 million Americans suffer from anxiety. It's more than 10% of the population. 5% of us have depression, which is the number one cause of disability worldwide. And what's worse, 75% of those of us with depression never seek treatment for it. Which is what helps us understand part of the crisis of suicide, with 700,000 people committing suicide each year. Many of them unnecessarily, because they didn't feel comfortable reaching out for help. And we didn't know what to say or what to do. So that has to change. So we're now discussing these four crises. There's a crisis of the physical heart, crisis of the emotional heart, and there's a crisis of the social heart. 
Did anyone see our Surgeon General's report this year, Sir Vivek Murthy? Our Surgeon General said that the epidemic of our time is loneliness. If you go back 50 years, looking at survey data, the average American had, any guess how many close friends that they could call for salt or sugar? Five. If you look at the same survey data this past year, any guess, now I'm not talking about you or me, We've, so many of us came with friends, but the average American, how many close friends that they could rely on and really trust and feel trusted by? I haven't seen the right answer yet. Just saw the right answer. Zero. So this is another crisis of our time, the crisis and epidemic of loneliness. And there's something we can do about it, because now this ties in to why we're experiencing the emotions that we are, which is tying in to why we're experiencing the physical heart crisis that we are. Many, much of that has to do with what we call maladaptive behaviors. We're not exercising, we're not eating healthy, we're not treating ourselves well, and we're not treating other people well. Now, the social crisis that we have is not just loneliness. It's also, as Mark spoke about at our last forum, we don't treat each other well. We have a crisis of dehumanizing those around us. We see tribalism all over the world right now. If you want to understand the political crisis of our time, think about the social heart. And think about whether the people who are fighting have a whole heart or whether it's broken in some way. Think about the crisis of anger and hostility and cynicism. Do we talk about that? Do we address that? That's what this conversation is about. And I believe there are four dimensions of our heart. We've spoken about the physical, talking about the emotional heart, talking about the social heart. And I think beneath it all is the spiritual heart. If you look at recent data from this year from the Gallup organization, there's been a rapid decline in any religious affiliation in America in the past year, past few years. And when we're talking about spiritual, again, I'm not talking about a religious affiliation or a belief in any particular deity. I'm using the definition of spirituality that's used in healthcare, that's used by the American Association of Palliative Care Medicine, which is something more general, which has to do with, do you feel a sense of connection with something much greater than yourself? Could be nature, could be music, could be a cause or a purpose. Do you feel a sense of belonging, not with the people around you, but with all people? Do you feel like you belong in this world? For me, that's part and parcel of what spirituality is, spiritual belonging. And until we start speaking about these things, it's not normal. I can tell you, as Dr. Harris attested to, it's not normal for a cardiologist to address the spiritual crisis of our patients. And again, I'm not suggesting that, that I should act like a rabbi for my patients, but with a little bit more sensitivity, I think our healthcare system can do a better service. And at the same time, I don't place any responsibility on our healthcare system, though I proudly have us wear the mantle. There's a billion dollar wellness industry, which I know all of us have funded in one way or another. And I think there's some responsibility there for starting to take a more integrated view and not casting doubt and aspersions on well-established science in, in the Western world. But can we find an integrated way? Is it possible for science and spirituality to live together? I don't know the answer. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So these are the crisis of our time. It doesn't give us a lot of hope, does it? But I see lots of reasons for hope. The first one comes from a strange place. It comes from, again, 1990s with the earthquake and people were dying of heart attacks. Now that's not hopeful. But what was hopeful is this condition called the broken heart syndrome, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, started getting scientists thinking and recognizing the power of our day-to-day -day emotions on our physical health and our hearts. So now, if I yell at my teenage son, I'm sorry, Noah, <laughs> it's not hurting only my son and the rest of the family. Whose heart do you think is being injured in the process? It's me. If someone cuts me off in traffic and my instinct is to yell at them, whose heart am I potentially damaging? My own. That's part of the message here. So I said that there's reason for hope. 
Well, there's another story in addition to that broken heart syndrome, and it goes back to 1978 when a researcher named Dr. Robert Narum was helping us find out why heart attacks happen in the first place. You know, we take it for granted. Heart attacks happen because of blocked arteries, right? Well, in the 1950s and 60s, we didn't know that. So experimenters were taking rabbits in cages and feeding them basically cheeseburgers, uh, fatty, gross food, to show that that was one of the causes of blockages called plaques in the arteries of the heart. And then they would dissect these poor rabbits. So all of that is well and good. There were no surprises until Dr. Narum looked at his data after one season of feeding these all the rabbits the same thing. There was a group of rabbits that didn't have blockages in their hearts. And he said, this can't be right. He went back and he checked the slides. There were 60% fewer blockages in one small group of rabbits. And so he went back to the lab journals of the technicians, all the technicians that were working for him, and he found that all of the healthy rabbits shared one thing in common, and that was one technician, a lab assistant, who didn't just feed them. When she had her time to feed the rabbits, she would take them out of their cage, hold them, cuddle them, pet them, and talk to them. And that's what later became known as the rabbit effect. A beautiful book by Dr. Kelly Harding wrote all about that. So now we have a, an evolving story. On the one hand, we have profound grief and sadness and everything on the spectrum there affecting our, our heart in a negative way. And on the other hand, we have the potential to heal our hearts and to protect our hearts from even toxic exposures that might otherwise cause problems. And again, this isn't magic. This isn't mysticism. This is an evolving science. So, we're going to fast forward 30 years. The last 30 years since these have been discovered have shown us through epidemiologic data what's called prospective trials where you randomize people to different uh, psychological states, negative, and then years later positive. And we have some compelling data that there are what I call heartbreakers. And this is one of the takeaways of tonight's talk. As you go through your life, I want you to think about the emotions you experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And I want to say something up front. I'm going to talk about negative emotions and positive emotions. That's for convenience and clarity. There are no such things as negative emotions, good emotions, bad emotions. Emotions are information that tell us that something important is happening. That's it. And with that, when we think about the heartbreakers, there's a constellation of seven or eight emotions that I have seen in a review of the literature particularly are damaging to the heart. These include loneliness, grief, anger, and particularly hostility, which is the habitual outward display of anger towards others, higher rates of heart attack, and anxiety and depression and PTSD. Now, the good news is each one of these has a treatment, more than one, whether we're talking about mindfulness or cognitive behavioral therapy or medications or seeing a therapist or going to group therapy or joining a community there, or going for a walk outside or going for a run, listening to music. There are so many ways to help regulate these challenges of day-to-day -day life that, if not addressed, can lead to these heartbreakers. On the other hand, there are what I like to think of and call the heart wakers. These are emotions that can help us wake up to the fullness of our lives. Not just in a touchy-feely way, they also have been shown to release chemicals, neurochemicals, that affect our heart and blood vessels in a healthy way. Partly why the rabbits treated with compassion did better. So what are the heart wakers that I want you to think about? And think about whether you can bring more of these into your lives. I'm sure you can come up with some guesses. Any guesses? Gratitude, number one, gratitude. Optimism. I'm going to put you on the spot. We talked about Diane Chips Bailey. Generosity, right? Generosity and giving. We know that people who give of their money, of their time, of their attention, particularly as we get older, live longer, live better. Generosity is a heart waker. 
the other heart wakers are a little more obvious. Compassion, love, people who experience more emotions on the side of the spectrum of love and compassion and kind thoughts towards others and towards the world have more of a sense of belonging, have more of a sense of purpose. So it's natural that their body is not flooded with the stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, epinephrine, and instead, people who are actively engaged in gratitude, optimism, generosity, kindness, love, purpose, passion, these are the heart wakers that release the feel-good chemicals, endorphins, serotonin. So we have our heartbreakers and our heart wakers. How did we get to this situation where we've got these four crises of our time? Should we take a little, little trip down history lane? Yeah? Any history buffs? Mark, how's my time? Good. Okay. Got the all clear. We weren't always like this. You know, it's easy to look at what's happening in society today and to say, this is normal. 40 million Americans suffering from anxiety. This is just how it is. It's modern life. I reject that. It's not normal. It's a normal reaction to abnormal cultural messages that we're getting, abnormal behaviors from our leaders and our institutions. If we say it's normal, we're giving up. If we recognize that this is not OK, then we can each find what we can do in our own lives to make a difference, bring more heart wakers, and learn how to navigate and negotiate the heartbreakers. So if we look at ancient Eastern civilizations, we can go back to the Egyptians 3,000 years ago. The Egyptians had an amazing practice, which you can read about in their Book of the Dead. And here's what they believed. So quick question. If you were to look at a mummy, what's the one organ that is put back into the mummified body before it is sent off to the afterlife? Any guesses? The heart. Why is that? It was not because the Egyptians and the pharaohs believed that it was just a metaphor. There was a literal belief. Imagine a literal belief. Everyone thought that the soul and the spirit resided in the heart itself, and there was no admission to the afterlife without the physical heart. And so they believed that soon after dying, the person's heart was put on a scale by the goddess Ma'at and weighed against a feather. And if the heart was heavier than a feather because of misdeeds and behaviors in the lifetime of that person, they were not only not admitted to the afterlife, but they were devoured by the goddess Amit. It wasn't just ancient Egypt that had this belief. Aristotle, he was a smart dude. He also had a firm belief that the soul and spirit resided in the heart. Others around that time, beginning with the ancient Chinese culture, and we now many people practice traditional Chinese medicine, still carry these beliefs over. In that culture and tradition, there is no word for heart that just means heart. And there is no word for brain that means brain. And there's no separate word that just means spirit. There's only one word. The word is shin, which means something like mind heart, spirit, all together. If you look at the Japanese tradition, they have another word. Their translation of the word shin is the word kokoro, which is very hard to explain because there is no artificial separation between the mind and the heart, which are deeply connected. The Incans and the Mayans, you can look at any ancient tradition. But why is it in the West that we are here today having to have a conversation from a heart doctor who also meditates with his patients discussing and trying to prove that the mind and heart are deeply connected and there's no separation. There is just one heart, the emotional heart, the spiritual heart, social heart, and physical heart. Well, part of the reason is because of Western science and the way that it took place. If you go back to Galen, who was a Roman physician, a brilliant dude, a few hundred years after Aristotle, he did some of the first dissections of the human body. And Galen dissected the hearts of animals. He didn't see a soul or a spirit in there, but he saw blood. And they believed that there were four humors at that time, so they didn't get it all right. But Galen really shifted the ways that we humans started to think about this heart. 
So there was a decline in spiritual belief, and there was an ascent in more Western scientific methods. Fast forward now to the 1500s, we have the Flemish scientists, Vesalius, who read Galen's work and said, well, I'm not going to depend on dissections of animals. Let's see what human hearts look like. So he went to the mortuary, and he dissected human hearts. And then, the same century, William Harvey in England went even further and wrote the most beautiful book describing our current understanding of the cardiovascular system. This was all happening during the age of reason, the Enlightenment, which was a wonderful thing, but I think something happened during the age of Enlightenment where many of us started to believe that all good things come from the mind. And the heart was relegated in what's called the hierarchy of the body to a much lower place than it was before. And what I'm calling for, what I'm inviting you to think about, is it possible that we've We've cast the heart aside, and it's time to welcome it back into this hierarchy. So where do we go from here? Well, there are different ways to approach these four crises. I, not knowing the answer, decided to look back to Aristotle, because my mom, uh, rest in peace, she always had a stack of books at her bedside table. And more often than not, her books were about the ancient Romans and the ancient Greeks. She was fascinated. She was obsessed. So I looked to Aristotle. What would he say about how we should live so that we nurture all dimensions of our being, of our humanity? And what he would say is, let's look to virtues. Virtues are kind of like a, a road map or a guide, these general principles of how to live a good life. So look at Aristotle's work and then if you fast forward to the last century, there's a field of positive psychology, which says that Freud was so obsessed with negativity and depression, let's look on the bright side and think about how to live well and to flourish, not just avoid burnout and depression. And scientists, Seligman and Peterson, studied all the great literature back to Aristotle and said, what are the common virtues? And they found that there were just six across all world traditions. So then I looked at those virtues and I said, which of those have a connotation and association with the human heart? So I came up with these seven traits of the heart. And the way I really came up with them is because of many of you. I thought about my friends and my family and people that I respect. And I thought, what are the common qualities that these people live with, that they're able to live with such joy, love, connection, and health? And so these are what I call the seven timeless traits of the heart. The first is essential. If I'm called to an emergency room to see a patient with an abnormal heart rhythm, before I talk about their family history, I'm going to steady their heart, stabilize the rhythm. So first we have to find steadiness within ourselves. And that's the first timeless trait, a steadiness of the heart. And there are lots of ways to do that, working with stress in the mind, stress in the body, using mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy. Again, exercise, so many ways to work with stress. After we've studied our heart, what's the next virtue, the next trait that's timeless and universal? It's wisdom. We heard from the back here about the, the wisdom of the heart. I firmly believe that we are ignoring the wisdom of the heart itself at our own peril. So focused on the brilliance and the an analysis that the mind can do, we forget that there is a heart in the chest that's giving us information. I don't mean metaphorically. I mean, how do I feel with this person? the way that they're speaking to me. How does it feel in here? And so we have to look at wisdom. And then after we moved from wisdom, another key trait is openness. And Adam Grant writes about this in his recent book called Think Again, which is one of the traits of great leaders is the ability to let go of what you think you already know and be open to new ideas, be open to new artistic expression. So this is the power of openness, and we all know open-hearted people. Some of that is an openness to connection with others. Now, I know we want to get to love. We want to get to compassion. We want to get to connection. But we can't get there unless we do the groundwork, steady our own hearts, work with our own stresses, find our own wisdom, understanding the roots of happiness and the paths that lead us away from happiness, learning how to open our hearts. And this leads us to the next step living with a whole heart. 
That's how I want to live. How do we live with a whole heart? There's a couple of things we need to do. One is we have to be here in this age of distraction. It's impossible to show up wholeheartedly for the people that care about you and need you if your mind is somewhere else and habitually checking a device or returning to some drama of the past. So we need also, we need to integrate our past. We need to look at some of the wounds that have happened from our childhood, work with a qualified therapist, so that those wounds don't keep acting out with the person that's in front of us. Living with a whole heart means living with passion, living with purpose. So after now we're living with a whole heart, what's required? Some say that the essential timeless trait is courage. Does anyone know the root of the word courage from the Latin? Core, meaning? Courage comes from the heart. It comes, the word heart from the Latin. Can we find more courage in our lives? Which means not, not having fear. Courage is feeling fear and taking action anyway. Finding ways to work through that. And once we've found that courage, I know plenty of people that I admire who are courageous and they live wholeheartedly. They have one thing in common that's uh, it's really, for me, one of the most special qualities, and that's a lightness of heart. Does anyone know a spiritual leader who doesn't have a lightness of heart? I don't know of any that I would listen to. So how do we create lightness of heart? This was alluded to by Peter uh, earlier. It begins with like an airplane. You have to sort of let go. Not an airplane, but a spaceship. How about a spaceship? Let go of the fuselage in order to take off. But then you also need jet fuel in order to lift yourself up. So finding lightness of heart is not only a letting go of the past and letting, not letting it go, letting it be, but also finding these heart wakers and being an expert and a connoisseur and a hunter and a gatherer of these heart waking emotions in your day to day life. Can I create or remember or savor moments in my life of marvel, of awe, of wonder, of connection, of gratitude, of kindness. And it doesn't have to be something I experienced. I can read about it in a book and experience those same emotions. That's how we find lightness of the heart. And along with lightness, we need something else, which is laughter. And one of the best laughers that I know is in this room, and that's my friend Lance Rieger in the back. If you ever have a chance, his laugh is infectious. Now, all these six timeless traits are not there for their own sake. I've laid them out in a very specific way. Frankly, I'm not interested in only living with a light heart. And my mom, if she were here, she would tell you something she told me when I was a teenager, which I took the wrong way at the time. She said, Johnny, happiness is overrated. I think what she meant was, don't chase simple pleasures. Don't chase happiness. Instead. Develop yourself, serve people well, and happiness will come afterwards. And the final trait is warmth of the heart. That's what the world needs now. We need more warm-hearted people. We need warm-hearted leaders, warm-hearted spouses, warm-hearted children, warm-hearted parents, warm-hearted civic leaders. So these are the seven timeless traits of the heart. What do we do with them? I want your minds to be thinking now. I want your hearts to be feeling. How can I apply these seven traits? Not a year from now, but today. With the person that I came with, or that I'm going home to, or that I'm going to text later or call later, how can I bring more steadiness to my own life and bring more steadiness to their life? How can I bring more lightness to my life and to their life? Because it not only heals the emotional heart, and the social heart and the spiritual heart, but it heals the physical heart as well. In closing, I'm going to invite you all to be like the coronary arteries. <laughs> Think about that. If you watch the human heart beat, it's, it's really amazing. So the heart ejects blood, and you think that it's going to eject its blood straight to the brain, straight to the kidney, straight to the liver, straight to the muscles so that they can do their job. That's not what happens. 
The first few ounces of blood that are ejected with each of the 100,000 heartbeats that you're all going to have in the next 24 hours, the first few ounces comes directly back to the heart itself, down the coronary arteries to feed and nurture itself. That is not a selfish act. Because the heart does that so that it can be in service of the body. So my invitation to you is in your roles as leaders, and you're all leaders, is can you be like the coronaries to nurture yourselves, to nurture all four dimensions of your heart, and to share that with others? Thank you.